This is In Character. I'm your host, Gerard Robinson, Vice President for Education at the Advanced Studies in Culture Foundation. Uh, I'm joined by someone who was a part of a group conversation where we talked about equity. And she made some really profound points about what is equity and what it's not. And as you know, once we do a group discussion, we want to do a one-on-one, just do a deeper dive to get a chance to know more about Kalisa, her work, uh, what she's done in the past and what she's doing now. So with that said, welcome back to In Character. Thank you so much for having me, Gerard. So for those who have yet to listen or to watch uh, your group discussion, who's Kalisa? Kalisa is a regular schmegular girl from Toledo, Ohio, (laughs) who who enlisted in the United States Army um, as a means to go to college um, and and just always wanted to be an educator. And uh, I've been in in education for about 14 years now. Um, Love language arts, um, believe that literacy is a, is a right um, and that all students deserve to be literate. So that's just a, a little bit about my background. Um, I am a staunch uh, advocate for uh, school discipline reform, uh, for dismantling the school to prison pipeline, and, um, and just for ensuring that we have a social and emotional equity. When you decided to join the military, did you know at that time you wanted to be a teacher? And if not, what was the aha moment that made you say, this is what I want to do? Oh, yes. I knew I wanted to be a teacher my junior year, actually, in, in high school. I was a, a camp counselor. And, uh, and that experience and working with the sixth graders, uh, and, and I was like, oh, my gosh, they, they're listening to me and they're actually doing what I say. And I'm only a few years older than them. And I I really decided then that I wanted to be an educator and I I picked English because um, I love writing. I love, I loved reading and I wanted to share that passion with students. So. So when you, so you, you complete your time and then you decide, you know what, I want to teach not just in any public school, like all of us may know, but you actually work in DOD schools. And so for those who may not know anything about DOD schools, talk to us about that. And what was it like? So uh, Department of Defense Education Activity operates um, in seven different states. Uh, we have schools in the Pacific, in Europe, um, throughout the Americas, uh, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam. Um, there's only a 10 minute time frame that our schools are not in operation um, because we even have schools in Bahrain, uh, which operate on Sundays and are closed on Friday. So, um, Working in DODIA schools, I think we have about 160 school, 62 schools right now, um, you know, worldwide. Um, I think that presents its own challenges because we have three different regions and, um, and we're constantly trying to be what we say is one DODIA <clears throat> operating in all these different regions and having, I mean, you got to be, um, I think, you know, you, you have to be responsive to what the community around you needs. And so what is necessary in Europe is not always the same as what we are experiencing in the Americas as well as um, in our Pacific hub. So it is definitely unique. Um, our students are extremely resilient. Um, one of the things I will say is that our students have all their basic needs met. So they have dental, they have medical, they have housing. Um, However, their emotional uh, needs are what I see as as the biggest challenge. I've had students who've lost parents in Afghanistan, Iraq, um, in different conflicts. It's definitely a different kind of situation. Um, the constant fear of I think the almost the entire time I was I've been in Dodia, we've been in some type of conflict, whether it be Iraq or Afghanistan, and so. Um, just that constant fear of what's going to happen to the, to the service member. Um, and, and knowing that ultimately our role as educators was really to make sure that the military is ready to go wherever they need to go to, to deal with any conflict that, that is necessary. And so um, that's the uniqueness. Um, I love the fact that all of our students receive the same amount of money uh, per pupil, regardless of where they live. Um, we're very, I would say we're very well resourced um, however, our students do have different challenges um, 
that, that they face that I think are very unique to our students who we call it outside the gate and outside then inside the gate. the gate. Yes. You know, what's interesting is you said housing, food, taken care of. We know in so many school systems, those two aren't met on top of other aspects. Same amount of funding across the, the, the school system. So you've taken finance off the table. Uh, the big unknown is possibly deployment. Um, I have a couple of friends I know who went to uh, deal with school in Germany uh, some decades ago. Some were here on this side and their big point was, we don't know where we're gonna be called for deployment. And so it gets to an aspect of education that we often don't have in the, I guess, outside the gate. When you taught in the schools, are you still DOEA right now? Yes, I am a professional development specialist. So you're here, any work, uh, Pacific, Atlantic, other side of the pond? Yeah, when I started in DODIA, I started in Germany. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I did six years there. So I was in our uh, one of the high schools and then one of the middle schools and then came to the States and Georgia, was a middle school um, teacher for five years and then uh, went to New York and was an assistant principal there. And now I'm a professional development specialist in Virginia. So I've kind of been all over. Um, I was stationed in Korea as a soldier, never worked, never worked in Dodia at that time. But I took some college courses in what is Seoul American High School, which is one of our high schools over there. So are there non-military children enrolled in Dodia or is it simply military? Well, we call it military connected. So um, okay. that means that their parents might work for Department of Defense as a civilian um, or the Department of the Army as a civilian. Um, some parents are contractors. Um, even when I was in West Point, New York, I had kids who were not military connected. Their parents were actually coaches for the West Point um, football team at the, at the university. Um, and so because they were connected in that way, they could go to the schools. Um, so uh, there's a lot of students whose parents are not active duty um, military or reserve, but they're connected either in the Department of Defense or Department of the Army or Department, you know, yeah. So they're connected. Mm -hmm. So you worked in different states. We mentioned New York, you talk about Georgia, you were in Germany, Korea. What does equity look like in your setting? Uh, one thing that I think that is universal, no matter where, no matter where I've been, is that um, there is definitely a divide, even with that um, equitable per pupil funding and, um, and even students having access to their basic needs, um, there's still definitely uh, a lack of belief um, for you know, our students of color um, and even gender, uh, depending on what the topics are, what the subject is, um, what we believe our students to be able to do and, and what we believe that that they have the capacity to be able to accomplish, I think has looked similar in, in different places, as well as um, you know, teachers and educators um, and the lack of diversity in that, in that aspect um, that has been seen no matter where I've been. Um, and especially when we start looking at leadership um, at the top, who, who is sitting in what position and making what decisions and are those people who are diverse um, is it reflective of the students who are sitting in our classroom? So, you know, equity to me truly just means making sure that our students have what they need in order to be successful. And that's not always, that's not always resources. Um, that's not always those basic needs. It's, it's what does that child need at that moment in order to, to accomplish the standard, the goal um, to to get to that college or career uh, opportunity that, that they're seeking in their life, so. Well, share with us one example where you had to address equity head on and what was the outcome? Uh, well, when I was an administrator, um, I was the only administrator, I'm sorry, I was the only person of color in the building minus the janitor. Um, and I really, found that to be problematic. I was really starting to ask questions about, um, have we not had teachers who are of color who've applied? Um, and I mean, that, that definitely was an uncomfortable situation and conversation to have because it was, it was early on um, when I first got into administration. 
Um, however, I, I wouldn't stop pressing and pressing and pressing. And I just kept being persistent. And, uh, and we finally got to hire our first educator of color uh, at the school that I was at, who's still there and doing, doing incredible. Um, but I think that the, the repercussion is like, knowing that you're going to create this uncomfortable situation for yourself. But I often look at it like you're kind of toiling the soil, right? If, if I'm working to plant something, I've got, I've got to really stir it up. I've got to break it up. I've got to uproot and tear down some things in order to make something new. And, and that's hard when you're the first one trying to do that. Um, so that, that's one situation. Uh, another situation was when I was in, uh, uh, when I was in Germany, noticing that a lot of our, our male students of color were really struggling um, in math and um, were constantly being referred, you know, out of the, out of the classroom, into the office, um, and, and having harsher, harsher punishments than many other students who were not of color, and just really kind of raising the, the points of, you know, what, what's going on here? Is there something else that we can do? Is there another, another path that we can try to, to channel these kids into? And so when I got to the middle school um, myself, and the principal was of color, and, uh, and we started, instead of having a DNF group, you know, we started meeting with these kids and giving them incentives and taking them out of the building and rewarding them for when they, when they were doing the right thing. And so we saw this huge turnaround. And so instead of coming at it in this negative light, um, looking to see what, what can we do to encourage and motivate these students to believe in themselves and their, and their capacity or propensity to be successful, so. Got it. Share with us, because many people may never get a chance to meet uh, someone like you who won an award for your great works. I won't spoil it. I'm just going to give hints. Uh, talk to us about the first time someone said, we're going to recommend you for award A to the moment you heard your name announced for winning award B. Um, well, we, it actually, when you're not, when I was nominated for teacher of the year, um, I found out that I was nominated, uh, and I wasn't going to apply because I never saw anybody who won the award who looked like me. And so um, I, I didn't want to go through the process uh, of spending time doing that. And I remember um, I found out one of my, it was a couple of my students who nominated me. And so when you find that out, I feel like when, when somebody takes the time to honor and recognize you, I think you should go ahead and honor them by going ahead and, and doing what you need to do to apply for it. And so I, I did, um, but the moment I, I remember when I found out I was a finalist for the state teacher of the year, and I, I couldn't even believe I was selected as district. Um, and I remember looking online and I saw these, for 20 years, these white women and, and nobody else. Um, and I remember crying and thinking they're, they're never gonna pick me. I, I don't fit the mold. Um, but I knew that, uh, because I had this opportunity to do the interview that I was just going to be unapologetically me and, and either they wanted that or they did not. And so I guess, um, you know, my advice to others, if you're recognized for something, just don't put on airs, be yourself. Um, if they want you, they want you. And if they don't, they don't. And when I found out that I was selected, I just, I mean, I was elated. I couldn't believe it. And, uh, and being the first person in Dodia, you know, in our 71 year history of being an educational organization, um, to be the first person of color uh, in Dodia to have won the award is, is definitely an honor. But it's even more of an honor now that I actually run our Teacher of the Year program and have now for two years. And now we have, we're on our third person of color to be the Teacher of the Year. We've increased our, um, you know, our diversity within the program by 80% in those two years. Um, you know, through our teacher of the year program, we're talking more about what is cultural, cultural responsiveness and how can we be culturally responsive for our students. Conversations that were never happening because there was never anybody in that space who had a different experience other than, um, other than being a white woman. Um, and then, you know, it had been 21 years before we even had another man be our, our teacher of the year uh, for the state. And then to have it be a black man 
uh, in 2020 uh, this year is just just incredible. So um, so those are the, the things. And I think that, you know, when you get a seat at the table, you have this responsibility to pull up some chairs and and try to make space for as many people as you possibly can. Well, I want to thank you for sharing your story with us, for opening up a portion of your life. Uh, you were also a mom, and that's another aspect of the education process. <laughs> one's, going to, one's going to walk in right now and wave at some point. But he this might. Is just, he always makes an appearance. I'm shocked that he hasn't, but he's, he's with me in spirit. <laughs> well, and, and he's more than welcome if he walks in now. Good. Well, thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for opening up also uh, Do Do Dia. Because many of us who, if we don't have any friends in the military or who've traveled, have no idea. And you've uh, put some good things on the table for us to consider, particularly as we look at what 2021 is going to look like in terms of uh, K-12 education. So keep up the good work and know that we here at uh, In Character want to support you where we can. Thank you so much, Gerard. Take care.